Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Colas, and I am the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Thank you so much for joining me today on our Lunch and Learn call with the Whole Being Institute. Today, we're going to be talking about expanding capacity and increasing resilience with Jean Campbell. When we expand emotionally as a result of living through challenging times, we also gain the opportunity to tap into greater joy and connection in our relationships. At this stressful time in our history, we need more tools and more space for recovery time to allow our bodies to catch up so that our experience can be integrated, our emotional capacity can actually expand, and we can step more fully into our resilience. Jean will guide us through a series of exercises from a variety of somatic healing modalities that will help us expand our emotional capacity and resilience, and even increase our ability to give ourselves permission to be human. A little bit about Jean. Uh, Jean is an LCSW, uh, SEP and TEP. She has uh, been bringing together groups of people to heal for more than 25 years. She blends her extensive experience in psychodrama sociometry, somatic experiencing, so psychodramatic bodywork, attachment theory, and positive, positive psychology to help those working through trauma, addiction, codependency, and relationship challenges by providing personal growth workshops and intensive. Psychodrama training workshops for professionals and leadership retreats. Jean is an alumni of the Whole Being Institute Certificate in Positive Psychology. She's committed to creating safe spaces for healing and growth and trust that we can't do alone what we can do together. Jean, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you just have to unmute. Yeah, I did. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting yeah. me. And thanks to Phoebe for inviting me. Yeah. And are, did I hear you right? You said you were calling from California? I am. I am about halfway between Los Angeles and San Diego. Okay. Well, um, we welcome our West Coast kin to the call. And thank you so much for being here today. Can you tell us a little bit about, it sounds like you're a graduate of the Whole Being Institute, but uh, I am. how you came to, to know about the Whole Being Institute? Uh, it's all Phoebe's fault. Uh, <laughs> Um, Phoebe and I have known each other for probably about 27 years would be my guess. We kind of grew up together in the psychodrama community. We're psychodramatic sisters. And uh, I had been hearing about whole being for years from her and jumped at the chance to do the, the course when they had a cohort in California and uh, did that year long course and learned so much and have integrated so much from that experience. And, you know, as a clinician, it was definitely of interest to me to start to look at things from a positive perspective. So often in the addiction world, we look at things from a pathology perspective and to be able to look at things from a strengths pers perspective felt really important for me. And also, I, part of why I took that course was I wanted to change my own bias to positivity from negativity. And it has absolutely helped me do that. Amazing. Um, one of the things that we talked about with Gary, if anybody was here on the call, was this idea of capacity. Gary, uh, the feather was on our call on Tuesday, and we were talking about post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we can actually increase our capacity at this time, which I, I found uh, stunning. And mm -hmm. I know that you are, in a way, going to to tell us how we do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should we just jump into it? Let's just jump into this. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen and I will make the slides available for folks who want them. I'm happy to do that. Um, so right now in our world, I hope everybody can see this, that the, the menus are not covering anything, but um, we're having to deal with some realities uh, that none of us anticipated. And here we all are kind of trucking along in our lives. And then I keep thinking of the line from Hamilton, the world turned upside down because that's what happened in March. Everything just turned upside down. And so when I think about resilience and or post-traumatic growth, I think about being able to take those pieces 
and put them back together in a different way. And we're never going to be the same as a result of living through this, but we can still make something beautiful out of where we are uh, and, and what's going on in our lives. And so um, when we talk about our first line of defense when it comes to this kind of threat to our nervous systems, our first line is the social engagement. It is being able to connect with one another. It's being able to co-regulate. So that's a neurobiology term that basically means regulation is basically a sense of equilibrium, the capacity to kind of calm ourselves down. And particularly at this time when it's been really challenging to go through all of this. I mean, between the pandemic and the protests, and I mean, we're living, in, I'm living in California with horrific fires, and uh, we've had quite a few earthquakes recently. And then, as you mentioned, Carolyn, the debates that happen, the political climate, there's a lot. And so when, when I get dysregulated, one of the ways that I help bring myself back into that sense of equilibrium is I can reach out to somebody else who has a calmer nervous system on that particular day. Um, I've, I've been around the world of recovery for a very long time and, and a, a dear colleague of mine always says, um, the reason that recovery works is that we're never all crazy on the same day. And so we've been having to rely on each other and you don't have to be in recovery to have those kinds of connections. But that is our first line of defense. And as a result of what's going on, we've had to override what our natural instinct is. Like I, uh, I am a former, well, I'll always be a New Yorker. I lived in New York basically my entire life up until about 16 years ago, having been in New York City during 9-11, like probably a lot of the callers today. Um, I remember specifically holding on to each other, having our tears, shaking with, with fear. And we're missing that right now. We're not able to have that, that, um, experience to help calm our systems because that sense of being held i mean we can get into a whole discussion that's like a whole nother teaching but that sense of being held calms the nervous system and so we don't have that right now so we're having to find other other ways other tools in lieu of that hearing the the, the voice of a loved one seeing the face of a loved one can help calm our nervous system. I mean, when 9-11 happened, I remember seeing a presentation by Bessel van der Kolk, who some of you may know about, who's a trauma expert. And I remember him saying, phone lines lit up around the world, even in places where nobody was near New York or Pennsylvania or Virginia, but people needed that co-regulation with each other. And so I really want to encourage folks, if you haven't been, to reach out to other people. Um, and we, we really have to stay connected. That is a key piece of the resilience. A lot of, I mean, some of you probably already know this, but a lot of animal shelters are now empty because so many people have adopted dogs and cats during the pandemic because they need company. Um, connecting with nature has been really important for a lot of folks because they haven't been able to physically connect with other people. And I always think about the word spirit. Um, and you were talking earlier, Caroline, I think before we turned on the recording about the, the word inspiration. And at its root, the word inspiration or spirit is, it means to breathe. It comes to us from the Latin and it literally means to breathe. And so a lot of times when people are struggling with their capacity, just a deep breath can make all the difference in the world. And that can be through uh, meditation practices, yoga practices, chanting practices, exercise, things like Nia, things like, um, oh, just going out for a walk. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes in terms of the importance of movement. So just very briefly, and I, if, if I start to throw out terms that sound a little too scientific for people, please somebody interrupt me and ask me to explain what the heck I'm talking about. So just simply, the nervous system our nervous system, our brain and our whole nervous system is separated into two parts. We have the sympathetic system, which gets our system going. It gets us mobilized and moving. And that is like the gas, putting your foot on the gas. The parasympathetic nervous system is the system that, blow, that slows us down. 
it's the brakes, it's putting on the brakes. And there are two branches of that. One is what we call low tone dorsal, which is kind of a fancy term, but basically we need to have in place enough capacity so that we can, the term we use is settle, so that we can have that, that deep breath, the shoulders drop, and we feel a sense of safety, we feel a sense of connection, we can let down our guard enough so that we can literally rest and digest. Because when we go into sympathetic activation, a lot of our systems will shut down. We can't digest well during that. Um, so we need that capacity to slow things down, to sleep, to rest, just to be able to sit still and meditate. Um, and when we get too overwhelmed, we'll go into what's called high tone dorsal where our system just shuts down. It's like tripping a fuse. And some of us have experienced that during this time. I know there've been a few days or parts of days where I have, where I've just sat in front of the TV and watched Netflix for six hours because it's like, I've just got to shut out everything. And so um, it's like system overload. So just to, to put it into really simple terms, we have what's called this window of tolerance. And it's our capacity to experience things and to, to have our emotional and our mental and our physical capacity all online at the same time. So we need our sympathetic system to mobilize. We need it to get off the couch. We need it to get out of bed in the morning. We also need it so that when some kind of threat comes into our environment, we can move into fight or flight. It's meant to be temporary. We're meant to respond to some kind of threat or perceived threat, and then our parasympathetic system is meant to meet that and help us calm down and go back to that sense of social engagement, to go back to that, that sense of settling. Um, and this is all coming to us from um, a book called Nurturing Resilience, which I highly recommend by Kathy Kane and Steve Terrell, both of whom I've had the honor of studying with. They're both somatic experiencing practitioners and Kathy's actually a senior trainer with the Somatic Experiencing Institute. Um, and the book is written more for clinicians, but I think it's, it's quite understandable for lay folks. You might just have to kind of slow down and read it in small chunks. Even I did at times, because it overwhelmed me uh, at times. So thanks to Phoebe, I got exposed to this wonderful article. And I do have a bibliography at the end, so folks will be able to look these things up. But this term that, that showed up recently by uh, Dr. Ann Mastin called surge capacity, and she identifies it, which is actually a somatic experiencing or interpersonal neurobiology concept, but I love this term. It's the adaptive systems that we can, can pull from for that kind of short-term survival in situations that are gonna challenge our nervous system. And so it's the key thing there is short-term. We're not meant to live in those places. And so what's happened as a result of so much stimulation on an ongoing basis, I mean, we're moving into month seven of this being in lockdown, uh, level, different levels of lockdown, um, but we're having to be in this sympathetic activation for such a long period of time that our capacity to have our parasympathetic system match that and come back to that place of rest and digest, we just don't have the capacity anymore. And so the article that, that Phoebe turned me on to, which is in the, the bibliography, basically says, your surge capacity is depleted. That's why you feel so awful. And we're all feeling it. So what we do is we turn to what Terrell and Kane call defensive accommodations. So we are eating more, we're drinking. I mean, I read a statistic months ago when New York was really at the height of the pandemic. Uh, I got contacted by a, a writer who was doing an article about the increase in the use of drugs and alcohol that people have been doing to, to cope with what's going on. And there was a statistic I read that 40% of people interviewed in New York City admitted to day drinking, which actually did, I thought it would be higher than that. And it probably was, and people were not admitting to it, which goes on a lot with these kinds of things. Um, but we're looking for any way we can to settle our nervous systems. And I really wanna stress 
this is a survival mechanism that we've been needing to turn to. A lot of us are regressing back to old behaviors because this is, it's testing us more than we could have ever imagined. So it's a, an artificial sense of settling, but we're doing what we need to do. Uh, some of us are doing better than others on, you know, some days people are really struggling, other days they're doing okay with it. So um, the whole idea behind doing these tools or doing any activities that are gonna help your nervous system is that we're gonna minimize the amount of sympathetic arousal and so what that means is, um, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I did watch the debate the other night and I actually was not as triggered as I thought I was going to be because I've spent years developing these tools and I kind of expected it was going to be pretty crazy. I don't know that any of us <laughs> anticipated it was going to be quite that crazy, but it didn't phase me as much as I've observed a lot of other people were phased because they don't have that same level of capacity. The other thing is when we build these tools, it will lower, sorry, it will raise our parasympathetic capacity. So as you see, the blue lines are getting bigger and bigger, right? They're moving in the direction of greater and greater capacity. When the threat comes to the system, I'm able to downregulate quicker as a result of that. So let me just pause for a second and make sure everybody's with me. And if anybody has a question, you can throw it in the chat and maybe Caroline, you could interrupt me and read it um, so that we can, uh, we can address those questions if anybody has them. Uh, but I am gonna carry on with the tools because that's really what I'm here to bring you today. Um, so, Gina, yes, Gina, please. I was thinking that this idea that our bodies are smart. Yes, right? they are. And that, in essence, when we go to these uh, shopping or drinking more or whatever, trying to calm our system down, right, or yes. settle, as you turned, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's just trying to, to deregulate or regulate, right? It's trying to, to downregulate and then bring a sense of regulation into the system. Absolutely. Our bodies are brilliant. They really are these survival mechanisms have kept us alive. And we're gonna go back to what works when we don't have anything else, right? Or when something is sustained for longer periods of time. And so I think when the pandemic first hit, it's kind of that big push, that big rally, that surge as the term is like, okay, we can do this, we can get through this together. And then it went longer and longer and longer and longer and it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight right now. I mean, we're now seeing numbers going up again across the country, which is not surprising. Kids are back in school, um, colder, you know, the weather's turning colder in a lot of the Northern states. So people are moving inside again. I, I mean, I know out here in California, people have been getting quite lax with wearing their masks. You know, the stores are still requiring it, but out on the street, out on the beach, people just aren't, they're not abiding by it because they're sick and tired of having to do it. And I get that. I really do. But unfortunately, you know, there may be consequences as a result of that. And so in our brilliance, we're doing the best we can to try to deal with that. And we were talking before the recording came on, Caroline, you were talking about that sense of denial. Denial, to a certain extent, is our friend. You know, I use this example, you know, when I lived in New York City for all those years, I rode the subway every day, at least twice a day. If I laid in bed in the morning and thought about, I'm going to get, I'm going to go underground and get in a metal tube with hundreds of people around me that I've never met before and hurl down tracks at whatever, 50 or 60 miles an hour, right? I was on the 7th Avenue Express train. I wouldn't get out of bed, right? So there's a certain level of denial that I have to have, a certain level of appropriate dissociation to function in the world. And when it gets to be too much and I'm constantly shut down, then I'm running into trouble. Then I'm not really functioning well. Uh, and that's going to affect, um, it's going to affect my relationships. It's going to affect my physical health. Uh, there's a term we use in somatic experience and called allostatic load. And we were talking about this also before the, the um, 
recording started, it's this idea that, you know, I'm dealing with this in my life and then the pandemic happens and then we have to go into lockdown and then protests happen and we have the election in the background and then in California, the fires are happening and we're dealing with climate change and huge hurricanes. It's like one thing on top of another on top of another and it's no surprise that the system just shuts down or wants to shut down. Um, so we're doing the best we can, and I think we really need to remember that. So it, it also I, seems like what we can do is learn to to hear the signals of the body. Exactly. Say, wait exactly. a second. And what I'm hoping you're going to do is help us say, okay, right? It reminds me of my friend who was pregnant and she was craving a beer, right? right. And she said, well, I know that that's not healthy, but what's in a beer? And then she said, well, you know, they're B, B vitamins. So she said, what else was in a B vitamin? So it's like having that. And then she was able to give herself food that was healthy. Exactly. That had, but her body went for the first thing that it remembered. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, particularly when people are pregnant, cravings, cravings are really important. Like I remember working, I had a boss a million years ago who um, in her third trimester was craving lobster and steak. I mean, she was not somebody who ate that kind of high fat food. But the nervous system of the baby is being developed in the, the final trimester, and that requires a lot of fat for the mother so that the nervous system can develop well. So, you know, listening to the body is really important, really, yeah. really important. And so if so I'm when, craving alcohol and I'm craving sweets and I'm craving this, I can say, wait a second, what do I really need exactly. to nurture myself? Exactly. Awesome. Because part of what I think about is emotional hunger versus physical hunger. Right. And so I'm craving, if I'm craving sweets, am I getting enough sweetness in my life? Right. If I'm craving alcohol, is that, am I craving that sense of ah, that comes into my system when I have a glass of wine or whatever? And what else can I do? And I'm not, you know, if somebody can drink sensibly and appropriately, then, you know, I'm not going to tell them they shouldn't have a glass of wine occasionally. If that's, something that is pleasurable and, and is working for you, great. I, I tend to work with people who can't stop at one, which is why we have to find other tools. So, um, but just, you know, it's a, a positive psychology concept to really stay with that sense of permission to be human. We are all challenged right now. It's just that simple. And so um, to stay with gratitude, to stay with um, you know, one of the tools I learned when I was at Whole Being Institute, and I still do it to this day, and I think I finished my course at least four years ago, it may be five now, I'd have to think about it for a minute. But every night when I do a gratitude list, I start by writing down at least two things I did well that day, which changes my focus. So many people right now are saying, oh, I'm not functioning well, I'm, I'm not getting things done, I'm not... I'm, you know, I mean, God bless all the parents home with young kids who are trying to work and homeschool and, and take care of themselves in the midst of all that. And it's like, oh, I didn't show up for my kids as much as I would have liked to today. Well, what did you do well? How did you show up, right? And so that going off to sleep with that positive focus, thinking about what I'm grateful for. And I mean, a lot of you have been on multiple calls that are related to Whole Being Institute, but just those simple concepts of gratitude like oh i had such a yummy cup of coffee this morning and to have gratitude for that or uh, one of the things that i know we did in my cohort that was so nurturing for me was that every day we would text each other we had a group text and we would text each other um, the best moment of the day that we had and every time my a text would come through from one of my fellow cohort members my positivity would get boosted as well hearing about it, seeing a video of it, seeing a picture of it, having them tell the story of it. And it really helped. And so uh, a colleague of mine out here in California actually has started um, a meeting once a week in the morning and she calls it the Silver Linings Group. And everybody comes on, there's a speaker every week who's talking about the silver linings in their life right now. And we go around and everybody names a silver lining that they've had in the past week. And it's a great boost to my week. Um, the other concept I want to talk about, and this is referring to what you were saying, Caroline, 
the idea of slowing down enough and you know phoebe uses this term all the time the idea of when we have a threat or some kind of crisis or a sense of overwhelm it's like a snow globe getting shaken and we need to allow time for those flakes to settle and so slowing down and just checking in with the body can be so important and giving you know my my colleague deborah sweet is a trauma therapist she's based up in oregon now and she talks about kind of pausing from time to time and allowing the body to catch up and the good news about that is that we can find a way with the appropriate tools to settle the bad news is that sometimes when people finally slow down all the feelings that they've been avoiding start to warm up and so you know in somatic experiencing we talk about this concept of pendulation right so when those feelings start to come up just dip a toe in and then go back if you have to go back to netflix then go back to netflix right don't dwell in that snow globing don't dwell in those feelings because they'll overwhelm your system if you do so uh, if you're feeling a sense of high agitation in your chest for example find a place in your body that feels calm or that at least doesn't feel agitation and put your focus there instead and stay there while the agitation in the chest shifts uh, and i'm going to jump into some some specific tools um, in a minute i just i've been thinking and, and i'm i'm not jewish i was raised catholic but having lived in new york as long as i did i'm always aware of the jewish calendar and I know we're about to head into Sukkot. And the, the thing about this quote that, um, that struck me is that piece where she says, Sukkot is a time to appreciate the shelter of our homes and the shelter of our bodies. And along the lines of what you were just saying, Caroline, to have, I have so much appreciation for this home, this somatic home that I live in, given all the trauma that I've experienced, given so many things that I've encountered in my life, including addiction and, and oh, I mean, we, we all could list so many traumas that we've had, small and large, developmental and shock traumas, um, but that our bodies have gotten us this far. They've gotten us to this point, and that's extraordinary. And to just take a moment to honor them uh, in the midst of all of this, to me is it, it's just an important it's one of those moments where i just when i thought about sukkot i was like let me just pause for a moment and i started kind of going around the internet and reading more about it and that just jumped out at me just to have that gratitude for um where i am and what my body where my body has gotten me to so i want to jump into some of these tools um, and there's a concept in somatic experiencing called orienting. It's not specific to them. This is a psychology uh, tool that's used. It's used in interpersonal neurobiology. It's used in brain spotting. It's used in all kinds of different modalities. Um, but the idea of orienting, and let me explain what that means, and then I'm actually going to dem demonstrate it. So when we orient, it literally means just to look around your space. And so um, there's two kinds. There's exploratory orienting where I'm not feeling any kind of threat and I can just kind of slowly look around and take in the room, which I'm demonstrating. And this is how slowly I would do it, right? I'm not rushing around, looking around. I'm slowly, you know, I've got a big plant over here and I've got some photos on my credenza. I've got my diffuser going with some yummy calming oils. I've got uh, a calendar on the wall i can see the sunlight streaming in right that's exploratory or in orienting as opposed to when we feel a threat of some kind our immediate response is to turn and where's that coming from the sound the sight the smell whatever it is so when we're feeling highly activated to orient from an exploratory standpoint so i'm just going to invite all of you for a moment to just very slowly look around your space really slowly and if possible find something that makes you smile or something that settles your nervous system something pleasant just let yourself take it in
And just notice if there's any difference in your nervous system having done that. Right, I see a couple of heads nodding. It can settle the system, right? And so finding that particular something, particularly when you're struggling, when you're activated, when you're having a hard day, uh, that can, it can make a huge difference. And one of my teachers in somatic experience in Burns Galloway, the end of every day when he was our teacher, when we would be leaving, he wouldn't say, see you tomorrow. He would always say, orient to pleasure. So he was really inviting us in the course of the rest of our day to look for things that were going to bring us pleasure or joy. Now, whether that's, you know, for me, often when I'm really struggling, I'm just overwhelmed, I've got too much work on my plate or the weight of the world is weighing on my shoulders, I will go out on my patio and I will just sit and watch the hummingbirds at my hummingbird feeder. That is a form of meditation and that is orienting to pleasure. Now, in somatic experiencing and interpersonal neurobiology, we know that the movement of the head actually helps settle the nervous system. It brings on that, um, that calming sense. It brings on the parasympathetic system. It brings on the brakes, right? The, um, the ventral vagal system, which is our social engagement, is connected to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve in our bodies runs from our brain all the way down to our spine, and it affects every organ in our system. Our heart, our lungs, all of the, the gastrointestinal system, the pancreas, all of it. And so anything that we can do to engage that ventral vagal, that vagus nerve in a calming way is gonna help calm the whole system. For a lot of people, they notice that the calmness may start in a particular location in the body, and it can help sometimes to imagine it spreading, almost like water lapping through the system, or whatever image works well for you. Um, so that, that sense of orienting, um, it's reminding me actually when I was in the SIP course too, uh, Tal Ben-Shahar was our teacher, and he has a quote that I, I still use to this day, uh, when you appreciate the good, the good appreciates. So if that's what I'm focusing on, if I'm focusing on the good, then I'm going to notice more of that. And I'm going to see more of that on a daily basis, because that's the filter that I'm looking at the world through. So it's that same kind of concept that Burns has. So I want to teach you uh, a technique from somatic experiencing called vooing. Some of you may already know this. Uh, Peter Levine, Dr. Peter Levine, created um, the modality somatic experiencing. And this absolutely will activate the vagus nerve in a way to help calm the system, the parasympathetic system. So the way it works, and then I'm going to demonstrate it for you, and then we're actually going to do it together, is you take a deep breath in, and on the exhale, you make a VU sound, V as in Victor, O-O, and it's meant to be a low register. So it's not a voo, it's a voo. It's a really low, deep register, like a foghorn. And it's meant to go all the way through the breath, fully through the exhale. So I'm gonna demo it first. And part of it is feeling the vibration in the chest or in the gut. So you're welcome to take yourself off mute for a minute so that we can, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the share so we can see each other's faces while we do that too. And you're welcome to take yourself off mute and we're going to voo together. Okay, so everybody deep breath in. <sighs> Let's do another one. And one more. And 
when you're ready. If your eyes were closed, you can open them. Does anybody want to unmute yourself or share a little bit about how that was for them? Just raise your hand and I can unmute you. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, was that Adrian you want to? I have to ask you to unmute. Okay, go ahead, Adrian. You have to unmute. Goes, you go into yourself, to your core. Like it helps you like find, you know, center yourself. Exactly. Like if you go to yourself. Beautiful. I couldn't have said it better than, than that, Adrian. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Let's see if I go through the pages. We've got a couple pages here. Anybody raising their hands? I see Rachel's cat has, is raising her tail. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie's typing in the chat. It reminds me of the shofar. Perfect. Ah, yeah. ah, how perfect. I didn't even think of that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for that. And we've had some questions in the chat about salty foods and, and people have been answering. Uh, what called if called your cat salty? over, Rachel, as she just said, yes. Animals love booing. Sorry, the question, Caroline? The question was, if you're craving salty foods, what do you substitute sweet and sweets? And someone said pickles. Pickles are good. Um, it, it might also mean, I mean, I'm, I, I'm outside my scope of practice here. That would be a better question for a dietitian or a doctor but, or a naturopath. But if I'm craving salt, it often means I'm dehydrated too. Um, and one of my naturopathic doctors taught me that electrolyte water is actually just pink salt, Himalayan salt in water. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Or for some people, there are um, little packets that you can get for electrolyte balance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's out of my scope of practice. But uh, So are we increasing our vagal tone? We are increasing that, our that vagal tone happening? by doing that. Yes. And, and our coherence? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And our somatic resilience. That, all of that is increasing. Um, and... The thing about the VU, and I want to reiterate this because it's an important point, is that for a lot of people who've been in freeze, when they start to VU, it might actually bring them out of freeze and it may be a little too much. So you might only want to do a very short VU for half a breath, right? To not do the full one, to not do three or four of them. Again, I have a lot of capacity and so um, I tend to do three of them as part of my meditation every morning, which really helps me. And even last night when I climbed into bed, um, I was a little activated. Just I should not have checked the news before I went to bed, <laughs> and I did. And I just, I, I did three boos, and it just settled my system enough that I could just turn on my side and go to sleep. Um, so I'm going to throw a bunch of different tools at you today, and you can choose whichever one's um, work for you. The other one I want to teach you, it's, it's similar to this, and then I'll go back to the PowerPoint, is a lot of people have been feeling a lot of um, irritation as a result of this, right? It's the fight mechanism that wants to come on board uh, because there's a lot, you know, when, when a threat comes to us, we go one of two ways initially. We go to fight or we run away. And so for a lot of people who've been dealing with, with irritation or anger, uh, there's certainly been a lot of anger around us lately. Uh, there's a variation on the VU. It's called the VU Roar, which I'll teach you. Um, and basically, you do a VU, and then you're going to move your mouth into a roar sound. And the whole idea is to really move the jaw, uh, because anger from positive psychology, sorry, from somatic psychodramatic body work, we know this from Chinese medicine, uh, the meridians... Um, Anger runs through the jaw. It's where we hold it. So a lot of people struggle with TMJ, for example, or sometimes if I've been clenching overnight, I wake up and my inner ear hurts uh, because I'm in that kind of uh, bracing or lockdown. And so I'll demo the VU roar. Um, so again, it's a deep breath, doing the VU and then roaring with it. So and you really want to 
make it as big as possible. And you can do it in any combination that you want. Some people will do VU, ROAR, VU, ROAR. Some people do VU, they do five ROARs, then they do a VU. Just trust your body. Your body knows what you need to do. So we're just gonna do that together and do it in whatever sequence you wanna do it. Okay, so deep breath in. So I'm seeing a note in the chat. Somebody said they do a similar exercise in Qigong class. What this does is it helps loosen up the, the constriction in the jaw and it also helps move anger out of the system. It helps that fight response because so often what happens is the fight or the flight gets, um, it gets stopped uh, because we can't, we can't move into it. I mean, for those of you living in New York City, you were basically trapped in your homes for months with this pandemic because the numbers were so high. Um, and so the body has that urge when there is the threat to get into movement and you couldn't. So this is a way to help shift that. Um, so let me go back to um, the PowerPoint and share a couple of more tools with you. Let's see, so we've already done that and we've done the Vu Roar. Um, the other one that can be really helpful, if you're really locked into your jaw, we call it the soft tongue. You can just gently drop your jaw and let your tongue fall on the bottom of your mouth and just soften it. And really just let these muscles in the jaw just drop as much as they're willing to. Don't override your system, don't push it. If you, know, you can only open your mouth a teeny tiny amount, that's fine. Just drop it to the point where it naturally wants to go right now. And just soften your tongue. Just let it land in the front of your mouth. Um, it can, a lot of these exercises you can do with other people and then you have that sense of social engagement too. A lot of times when I do the Vu Roar with people, we both end up laughing. And laughter is a fear release. It's a discharge and it's good. You know, I, I remember years ago, uh, uh, one of my psychodrama trainers said to me, I, I did a particularly powerful psychodrama that day. It was my work. And he said to me at the end of the day, I want you to go home and take two Marx Brothers movies and call me in the morning. And it was just, it was perfect. It was exactly what I needed. Um, so another really important thing to think about is the concept of grounding. So there is in Chinese medicine, there's a kidney point on the bottom of our feet. So if this was my foot, the kidney point is right about here on the bottom of my foot. And the kidney and the bladder are connected to fear in our bodies. And so when we have our feet flat on the ground, it will allow that kidney point, the kidney one point in Chinese medicine, right? When we look at the meridians in the body, which are just these little rivers of energy that flow, the body gets dysregulated when there are blocks in that energy. So by grounding our feet, and you can even, um, well, we'll get to the tactile objects in the hand, but rubbing your feet on the carpet, really feeling that kidney point on the bottom of your foot, rubbing them on the floor. Um, some people have, I have this, um, it's by a company can, named Can Do, and um, a lot of times people use them for exercises too. It's like this plastic circular, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's used in gyms a lot uh, for people to be working on their balance, but it's got ridges on it. And sometimes I'll put that on the floor and just r gently rub my feet against it so that I can feel that sense of grounding. Um, for some people, I have this citrine stone it's soft. I sometimes will, um, it's like worry beads, the same kind of thing. You know, those are very common. Some people use, uh, I know a lot of people I was raised with, Catholic, who used rosary beads as a way to ground themselves. It was something to hold on to. Um, whatever works for you, uh, trust it, right? Trust the body. 
the other thing that's really important, and we've already talked about this, is that long-term stress can really lock us into freeze because we can't go into fight or flight. So movement is key. And it can be anything. It can be walking. It can be yoga, tai chi, qigong, biking, swimming, dancing. I mean, sometimes I'll just turn some music on and just start rocking out in my living room. Or I'll do a couple of yoga poses. Or even some of you may be familiar with um, Amy Cuddy's power poses. Um, she did a bunch of research about, you know, just, and this is definitely a yoga pose, like putting your arms up in the air. Um, also the Wonder Woman pose where you're standing with your hands on your hips, right? That, that power pose, lifting the head actually increases your mood. Because a lot of times when people go into freeze or they go into depression, there's, a, there's an inclination to pull inward. So any movement that we can have that will help us move outward I mean, it can be, I mean, I never studied dance, but I have friends, actually Phoebe and I have a mutual friend who was a dancer and, and just, you know, the port de bras where people bring their arms out like this in, in ballet and you can just do it. This is movement. This is going to help you unfreeze. Any movement that you can do, if, if you have difficulty with mobility, getting out of a chair, do movement in the chair. I mean, I was looking on the JCC, uh, calendar and you do yoga, chair yoga for people. That's one option, right? So just movement of any kind that's going to help people come out of that sense of freeze. Um, and again, we go into the freeze as a coping mechanism, but then with long-term stress, that coping mechanism starts to work against us to a certain extent. So it's going to lift your mood um, and do what you can, right? I mean, there's so many studies out there that just five, 10, 15 minutes of any kind of movement a day is going to help keep people. Actually, there was a, a Harvard study I was reading about that 15 minutes of movement a day uh, definitively shifted people's level of depression and helped them not sink back into depression. Um, shifting focus. We already talked about this a little bit, but the idea of pendulating. So if I'm feeling like if my gut is churning because I'm anxious, and I think we all have our particular Achilles heel, right? For some people, it's their gut. For some people, they get anxiety in the chest. For some people, they get low back pain. By the way, low back pain is about fear. It's the bladder and kidney meridians. Again, um, it's mostly the kidney meridians. But the idea is to notice where that is. Don't have judgment about it. Just notice it. It's there. And like you said, Caroline, it's giving us information. And once we notice it, let me find a place in my body that doesn't feel that way. Sometimes that other place is my baby toe. That's all, I, just somewhere. It could be a strand of hair. It doesn't matter where it is, but I'm shifting my focus to that place. So that will allow that anxiety to move through and potentially move out of the system. It's the same thing uh, with our vision, right? So the orienting, that's going to shift my focus. Um, also, the positive psychology uh, teachings help us know that, that shifting my focus in terms of looking, as I already said, looking for the, the best moment of the day, looking for things to be grateful for, finding the silver linings. I mean, for somebody like me, most of my work 95% of my work under normal conditions is done in person. It's done in groups. And for two years, I was telling myself, you know, I'm authorized, like I can give continuing education for therapists to do online learning. For two years, I kept telling myself, I should do some online courses and somehow never got around to it. Well, guess what? My silver lining has been, <laughs> I've been teaching online like crazy for the last six and a half months. So it's great. Um, and it kind of pushed my, my uh, growing edge to step into something new. Um, so as I said, if you can stay with that non-anxious place in the system, that anxious energy will naturally move. It doesn't mean it'll completely go away. You may need to play with it a little bit, but it will move. So a couple of other exercises that I want to teach you. This one comes from Dr. Peter Levine and Somatic Experiencing. I love this exercise. So under the arms, there is the heart constrictor meridian. 
um, which is about the area around the heart. So a lot of times when people go into fear or anger, they shut down their heart, right? So you put one hand under your left arm and then your other hand comes around to hug you. And just take a moment and let yourself just be with that. If you're comfortable closing your eyes, just notice your shoulders. For a lot of us, they tend to be locked up or braced and just notice the shoulders. Notice if they wanna shift in any way. And just let yourself notice your breath. I notice when I do this, I tend to settle more. My breath tends to get deeper. I just notice somebody yawning. That's the nervous system resetting. Yawning is good. Yawning is a down regulation in the system. Some people start to rock when they do this. It happens naturally. They don't even no notice they're doing it. Just go with the movement. Yeah. I was thinking the other day at a time like this, who doesn't want their good mommy <laughs> to hold them? <laughs> so another one I will teach you comes to us from the world of psychodramatic body work. We put one hand on our heart and then another hand on our bladder. Our bladder lives about halfway between our belly button and our groin. So it's right above your pubic bone. If you have to pee and you press on that area, it will be a little painful right now. So the bladder is connected to fear. So just again, just let yourself sink into that. And notice how the body responds. Feel your feet on the ground as you're doing it. I often do this right before I fall asleep. I'll just lie on my back and just put my hands here. I often do it during meditation too. It's just, it feels so comfortably containing for me. Now, if you have a loved one that you, you know, you're living together and you can touch each other, somebody can also put their hand on your back. We call that a heart sandwich in psychodramatic body work. That's Susan Aaron's work, where there's a hand on the front and a hand on the back. You can either put your own hand on the front or you can put your, have somebody put their hand on the back. The other thing that I've done sometimes is put a hot water bottle with some warm water behind me and have that on my back while my hand is on my, the front of my heart and a hand on my bladder. Um, that's another way to do this. Another is to put a hand across the forehead. This is best done if you can lean, you know, lean onto some pillows. So that way you don't have to work to hold up your head. It can make a really huge difference. And again, just settle in. Um, if there's someone who you're living with or that you're doing touch with that is safe touch and safe COVID touch, they can actually stand behind you in a chair if you're sitting in a chair and they can put a hand on your heart with your permission and a hand on your forehead and you can just lean back into their chest, that can be so comforting. Or they can put two hands on your heart in front. And just from a logistical standpoint, if you're not comfortable having somebody's hand on your heart, particularly for women because of our breasts, you can put your own, let me just tilt this down a little bit. You can put your own hand here and then somebody can put their hand on yours. And that way they don't have direct contact with your chest. Uh, or you can leave your own hand there and they can put a hand uh, on your back or on your forehead. And then lastly, the occipital sits right at the base of the head. And again, you, for some people, they like a hand in front and a hand behind. For some people, they like it on their heart. You can play with these configurations. Um, just make sure that the head is straight, that you're not, you don't wanna be tilting it back so that you're gonna wrench it. Um, just allow it. That's why it helps if you do it leaning against something so that you don't have to support your head. Um, it can be, I've done, I've, 
I've, I've uh, taught this to a lot of couples and parents, or parents of small children in particular, and having them um, do that for each other. It's a beautiful social engagement exercise, and it's just so comforting to support one another in that. So uh, I know we've just got just a couple of minutes left. I am a huge fan of essential oils. And you know, it doesn't have to be Young Living. Whatever oils you use, just get really good quality ones. Um, I have a really good diffuser, and there are a lot of oils out there, and Young Living's not the only one. There's doTERRA, there's all kinds of different ones, but I use them, I'll put them in my hand and smell them, I'll diffuse them, sometimes I'll put them on my wrists, and, or I'll put lavender on a tissue and put it on my pillow. Whatever tools you can use, let's not forget about the other senses. Right? It's not just sound and touch. The smell is a really important one. And just this is a reminder from Brene Brown um, that I, I think she put this out right when the pandemic started. Um, there's nothing wrong with us. Hard days are going to suck. And a lot of us have hit the wall multiple times. Um, and we are going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. It doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it's going to be okay. And for those of you who don't know her that well, she, uh, she has a wonderful podcast called uh, Unlocking Us. And she's got a lot of great tools on that podcast for folks. Um, and she actually did a special one on this uh, concept of surge capacity uh, this past week. So, um, so I'll throw it open for questions, comments, um, and turn it back over to Caroline. Yeah, now we have a couple of comments. Um, Mary Lou was saying, you know, the vooing reminds me of warming up vocally prior to singing and Absolutely. doesn't you know, like, sound like the shofar. Um, and then um, Debbie was saying, reminds me of the lion face in yoga. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yes. And we've got um, to get that fight response out of the system because it's going to build up and then it'll be too much and then we'll just shut down. Joy was asking, can a JCC post a list of these exercises for downloading and printing? Everyone on the call will receive a, a list of the um, PowerPoint. You'll get the PowerPoint. Yep. And also the recording. And it doesn't matter if you're a member of the JCC or not. Uh, we have the public and we have JCC members. So could you show the grounding exercises again, please? The hands-on list. Thanks sure. so much. Let me go back to that. And then just Karen, lots of love for you in the chat. Um, you're amazing, Jean. No wonder you and Phoebe are so close, says <laughs> Yeah, we grew up together. We did a lot of heart sandwiches with each other over the years. <laughs> we got each other through a lot of really challenging times. Oh, you know, Phoebe, I have a funny story to tell you. Phoebe was teaching me the heart sandwich, and I called it the hamburger sandwich. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, we, we, our teacher, Susan Aaron, and Phoebe and I were in training together with Susan, but um, that heart sandwich where there's a hand in front and a hand behind, um, that's what she calls the heart sandwich. And then there's what she calls the open face heart sandwich when there's no hand behind and it's just in the front. Um, so yeah. And again, I really want to invite people, trust your body because there are going to be some of these where your body says, nope. I don't like that. It doesn't feel comfortable. I don't want to do that. Don't, right? Don't override your nervous system. We're already having to override it enough. Trust when the, when the body says no, listen, really listen. Uh, and not to be overriding your emotions either. I mean, I have been consciously in the last couple of weeks in particular, seeking out music, TV shows, and movies that are going to help me cry because I have to discharge the energy because there's so much, of, there's such collective grief right now. We've hardly even touched the grief. We've been so focused on the fear and the anger. There's so much loss underneath that. There's a, in the article that, that I'll share with you, there's this concept of ambiguous loss. I mean, I'll share with you, my, my nephew and his wife have a, a 10 month old and the only, I haven't met him yet because of COVID. And there was a picture of him on, on Instagram the other night. He has his own Instagram page, of course. Um, it's a great way to share photos. And I just started sobbing 
because it's a loss that I've experienced as a result of this pandemic. And there are so many of those unspoken losses. I'll never, you know, we'll never get that time back. Kids in college who missed the, the end of their first year or their graduation, or I mean, there's so many losses that we've hardly even scratched the surface touching because we're just trying to get through it. And that actually is not uncommon that feelings catch up, right? A lot of times we get through the crisis and then we fall apart. So uh, just use whichever of these tools are gonna be helpful for you. The ones that don't feel right, let them go. Beautiful. And then uh, in relationship to demonstrating this, you know, I'm just going to say, because we are out of time, um, but Jean, people can listen to the recording again. That's what's a great thing about having really? the recording, but just go ahead and do the, do them really quickly because I do some, some so really one hand under the right, under the left arm, other hand around hugging. Right, and then you can really let yourself sink into that. I'm gonna go through these quickly, but obviously you would sink into that. Um, one hand on the heart, one hand on your bladder. Your bladder lives right above your pubic bone. It's not your belly, it's your bladder because the bladder's connected to fear. Another option is a hand on your heart and a hand on your forehead. And then a hand on your heart and a hand on the occipital which is in the base of the head and the back, or for some people, they want a hand on the front of the head and a hand on the back of the head. And again, you can do this with a loved one. They can do it for you, right? Or standing behind you, both hands on your heart, standing behind you. I've done this with people where I've had a hand on their heart and a hand on the front of their head and they just lean back into me or holding them like this and they, just, they can just relax and lean. Um, or the heart sandwich, hand in front, hand in back. So it right, reminds me of uh, the work that I've done, watsu in the pool. Yes, yes. Which is water shiatsu, where you're, you're carrying. Yes, watsu is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to unshare your screen. Thank you so much. Let everyone kind of wave to you, which is amazing. And then remind everybody, we are having sessions next week. It is the first day of October. Unbelievable to me, you know. Trish Walden will be here and she's going to be talking about living without regret, right? Because of COVID, we are in a time of unprecedented pause in every area of what was previously considered normal. This di disruption has created many challenges and also many opportunities to re-examine our priorities and also opportunities and choices. So she's going to talk about that. And uh, Suzanne Luther, oh, Suzanne Luther is Tuesday, Embodied Mindfulness, and Trish is Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I understand, Jean, that you're a, a colleague of Dan Tomasulo. I That's am. Well. Yes. Yeah. Dan and I trained with a lot of the same people. Yeah. Yeah. It's He's beautiful. amazing. He's yeah. extraordinary. He really is. Yeah. And, and we hope to have him back and you back as well after the election. I think we're, regardless of what happens, the outcome, I think we're all going to need some self-care. Would you, you agree, everybody? Uh, absolutely. So we're going to have, as part of our Lunch and Learn series, we're going to talk about that, like how to um, stay in hope in those times uh, post-election too. So stay tuned. Be well. Take care of yourself, everyone. Thank you so much, Jean. And thank, thank you, you, as always, Phoebe. Shana tova, everybody. Shana tova, everyone. Take Thank care. you so much. Bye. Bye.